Um, don't, know, don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling really inspired by what people are saying here. Uh, still haven't learned a single line of JavaScript yet, um, or learned how to do a user test. But starting to feel like the theme here is people, empathy, sensitivities to what others have to say, what they think about. And our next speaker, um, Julia Orson, who is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, teaches product, manager, product management. He's going to talk a little bit about her experiences and give you insight from what it's like to be somebody who actually has to transfer these skills from the folks that seem to know to the folks that want to know. So everybody, Julia Orson. at Harvard Business School now, but I have a past life uh, working with products as a practitioner. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that today, an insight that I then bring into the classroom. Uh, last week was a tough week for me. Last week, I had uh, the unfortunate experience of all three of my kids' grandparents being in the hospital. Um, that's my father-in-law on the left. You can see me peeking up on the top with my mother. My ex-husband and I were doing selfies to each other in our two uh, hospital rooms. And then his mom went into the hospital the next day. Uh, why do I bring this up? I was, my first is it's an excuse for this presentation. It's not as sexy as some of the presentations I've done in the past. Um, but the other is, while I was sitting in the hospital bed and while he was sitting in the other hospital beds or with, next to the beds, we had a lot of thoughts about the user experience in hospitals and in healthcare and what our parents were going through sitting in their beds. And it was deep insight for me. I'm a product nerd, so I'm constantly evaluating. How many of you guys in the room admit you're always evaluating products that you use, right? An app, a, a tool you buy on the shelf at Home Depot, whatever it is, we're constantly looking at them and saying, who came up with this? What were they trying to solve, right? So user experience doesn't stop. It's not just in the discovery phase. In my class with my students, we spend the first semester, it's a full year course, we spend the first semester just doing discovery. And they all come into the class with an idea. It's at ideation stage only. They haven't built anything yet. And I hold them back from building the product in the beginning because most of them have this idea that they know exactly how they're going to solve it, and 90% of them are totally wrong. right? They have no idea what the real problem is or whether it's even the right persona to deal with, and they all miss, once you start coming up with how you're going to solve it, that it doesn't stop. You don't, you're not done. You say, great, I have my MVP designed, I have a products requirement document, a PRD, and I'm just going to hire an engineer and go build it, and we're done. It never stops. So uh, we also build things, but we build it for a job to be done. This is one of my favorite quotes. Some of you probably heard this one before. Uh, people don't want a quarter inch drill. They want to drill a quarter inch hole, right? So. When we think about a job to be done, and let's go back to the hospital bed, we're creating something to serve a job, right? There's, there's something that needs to be done for the bed. So I'm sitting looking at my mom in this hospital bed. She's 86 years old, not very mobile, having a lot of health issues you can imagine for an 86-year-old. And I'm thinking, man, she's uncomfortable. And I can see it on her face and her expression. She's not feeling so great about being in that bed. And a lot of waiting was going on. We were waiting to figure out when they were going to let her out of the hospital and what was really wrong with her. She's OK, by the way. She's out now. Um, but I was watching and observing people coming in and out of her hotel room, yeah, her hotel room, her hospital room. It was not a hotel, for sure. Uh, and I was looking at them interact with this bed. And I was saying, what was this designed for? Right? It's got rails up to make sure she doesn't roll out of bed in the middle of the night. My mom barely moves. So I don't know how that was going to happen. Uh, they were using it to adjust it up to take her blood pressure. It could go up and down for her to get in and out of bed when they were taking her to do tests or whatever it was. Uh, it was serving utility for them, for the nurses and for the techs. And I was really wondering, had anyone asked patients, had anyone sat down with patients and asked them whether this bed worked for them? Were they comfortable in this bed? What was it was designed for? What was the job it was designed to do? And it made me think a lot about when we build software. I mostly do digital, so I think about building software, but it applies to anything that you build. 
who is the user, what are you designing it for, and what should the user experience be? And oftentimes, it's different jobs for different users. Oftentimes, we're building an application that's not just for the person sitting in front of the application. There's an end result or another user that we aren't even thinking about. Is this familiar to people, this, this picture, right? You're in your uh, kids, um, the pediatrics unit, or, or in uh, getting your exam for your kids, or you're sitting in the hospital. This was something similar to this was on the wall in the room with my mom. And I was thinking about, again, who was the designer that came up with it? I can't help myself. I'm always like, who did that? Why did they design it? And it wasn't the cute little faces. It was solving a job to be done, which is the nurse or the doctor could come in and see a patient and see an expression on their face. They look like they're in anguish. They're making moaning noises, whatever. Uh, they generally look unhappy. But their threshold, the patient's threshold for pain or discomfort, is very subjective. And having something like this that's designed to just say, how are you feeling in your own words, and your own feelings, because you're a human being, was a way to solve for understanding their patients better. This was better than that hospital bed, in my mind, right? This was a better design, a way to understand their user and get empathy for their user based on how they felt. Anyone who's building a product, when even though you may have the persona defined, we had Builder Bob earlier, whoever it was, Bob the Builder, uh, we kind of know what they need and what they want to do, but Bob versus Mary versus Sue is very different, right? So general use case, but how they feel and how they react to a product can be very different. So I thought this was a good chart in kind of thinking of how you build products. Very subjective by user. So now I'm going to go in the Wayback Machine. This is how old I am. This is the first application that I worked on, or something similar to this screen, uh, right out of college. I was working for National Trade Association for manufacturers reps. They repped uh, electronics, electronic equipment, wires, cables, nothing that is uh, sort of user interactive but very important to people building homes, construction, that kind of thing. And they built software clearly with no design because the, the role of a designer in user experience really wasn't invented back in the day. Uh, they were building products to just get the job done, which at the time was mostly inventory and tracking products and taking orders and just knowing what stuff they had in their warehouses. And in that job, for me, I was doing everything. It was a startup, essentially. There were six of us. And um, startup wasn't even a term, I think, in the, I'm going to date it now, it's the early 90s. And uh, I did everything. I was on the phone doing help desk support. I was on a plane doing training to the users of the product. Uh, crawling around for floors, putting in cables and wires myself, and uh, got lots of different viewpoints on what was going on with this product. The engineers were building the product in Hex. If it, does anyone know what Hex is, by the way? It's like really old. Uh, they were coming up with ideas all the time to make the product sexier for the buyer. We have buyer versus user. The buyer was the manufacturer's rep. The buyer was the person running the warehouse, making uh, the transactions and sales deals, not the user who was often their admin or a warehouse person or somebody who was doing the inventory and managing the supplies. This is super old school, but it's still, as you guys all know, exists today. When I was on the phone doing help desk support, which is probably about half of my time was doing, I was getting complaints from the users about very basic things like the lengths of these fields. So think about wires and cables. They come in different widths, they come in different lengths, and they come in different colors. So you could have a 100-yard you know, yellow cable uh, of certain thickness. And their biggest complaint with me on the phone was that the field to put the description, item description, should be from 15 characters to 25. That's all they cared about. That was their number one thing. They only wanted the product to be better that way because it made their job easier. I did this many decades ago, and it still sticks with me to this day, because when I would listen to the developers come to me and talk about fancy things they were building to make the product sexier, I'd be like, guys, they were all guys back then, guys, they don't care, right? The people who are using our product every day who care are the ones who just want a description field longer. Can you please just do that, and we'll make happy users. So what we think users need versus what they think is important isn't always the same thing, right? And certainly through our observations, through our interviews, we learn a lot about what's important, but sometimes we underestimate the importance of the simple, elegant improvements that we can make to our applications and our products. We also want to delight our customers and our users, right? This, I was trying to find this picture, it's like, mm, just like, they're gonna just love it, right? They're gonna be so happy, like, yes, we figured it out. We gave joy to our customers. 
uh, when we gave them our product. And my mom didn't have that face when she got into bed, by the way. I don't know if the nurses did either, but uh, we also want them to be heroes, right? Users want to be heroes. People who are using your products want to feel like they're kicking ass at their job because of the product that you made for them. So I'll use another example. I was at VMware for a number of years. Who knows VMware? Are you familiar with VMware virtualization? Uh, back in the early days, VMware was really targeting the data center operator. We were selling to the CIOs and folks who were running large data centers in large companies with large data centers, but our everyday user was the data center operator, the person who was making sure the VMs were running and provisioned for those who were asking for more horsepower, more compute, those kinds of things. So every year, we would do a user conference with about 25,000 customers who would come to the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And most of them were data center operators that were coming not just to learn about what was new for our product, but also get educated and do training, meet each other, that kind of stuff. And every year, like Apple and Steve Jobs, we would hold one precious new feature or product that we were going to announce at the conference, right? It was just our big moment. And I was part of the organizers of the conference and uh, our innovation team and would spend a lot of time evaluating the message and how we're going to come across for a new product or feature at the conference. And nine times out of 10, whatever we were creating as new or releasing as new or announcing uh, was really making the data center operator's job more obsolete. We were automating, we were building in new tools and capabilities that were basically telling the audience, you don't need to be here anymore. And I would always operate with fear of saying, how are we gonna tell them this? I mean, it's cool, it's really cool, but we're basically saying their jobs are going away and that's really scary. So we're creating great, exciting, delightful product, but maybe they won't feel like heroes anymore. But what actually would happen is we would announce it and the whole audience, 25,000 people in Moscone, have you guys been there? It's like crazy huge place. And I would just be like, it's amazing. And what was actually happening is, There'd be somebody sitting there and realizing, like, these two dudes next to me, they're not going to have a job this time next year. I'm going to be a freaking hero because I'm using this product. Was the product itself sexy? Not at all. I mean, it's data center stuff. Sorry. I mean, I've been in that business my whole life, so I can say that. Um, but we were making our customers users, our, I mean, our heroes. They were becoming rock stars at what they did. And that was a real driver for us to continue to build great products and not be afraid to announce new features like these, even though we felt like we might be turning some people off or making them feel like they were going, becoming obsolete. It was actually enabling them to go off and do more exciting, cool things, which is why we became a multi-billion dollar company, because we just kept building great new things. Anyway, you create these new things, you do discovery, but how often do we get it right the first time? Right, going back to the example of my classroom, my students build things in the beginning of the year. We do a lot of concierge MVP, lo-fi products. We don't build anything, no code whatsoever. Use paper, wireframes, y'all do that. Put things in front of your customers and figure out if you're getting it right or not. Even when you go through that process, it's not right the first time. Just to give some examples, uh, New Relic had done a test uh, or a study recently and said 66% of their customers are releasing weekly uh, new products, new features, new capabilities, bug fixes weekly because they didn't get it right the first time. Amazon averages a new push of software every 11.7 seconds, which is bananas, right? Netflix, thousands of times a day, they're pushing out changes and fixes to their products. Are they getting that same number of user feedback? Uh, back on, on their product? Are they getting that many responses? Are they getting thousands of feedbacks a day? Right? 11.7 seconds of tickets a day? I don't know. That's kind of crazy on average. Um, imagine if we got that much feedback from our customers to tell us whether or not we're creating heroes and giving them what they need or understanding what their pain points are for their product. So I've been asking myself a lot lately, especially as we're going, I'm now churning about 13 to 15 new products a year in my classroom. Um, how are we discovering and continuously learning and, and understanding our customers as we go through the process past discovery? Once it's released, once all those changes are starting to come out in velocity, how do we get it all back to us to understand? And where do we go to get the feedback? So we start with our customers. We talked about that already, right? We meet with our customers, our users. We understand the buyer versus the end user and what they're doing. We understand the human impact of our products on them as individuals. But do we also look inside? One of the things that I think we miss a lot is talking to those inside our businesses, and someone talked about this earlier today a little bit. 
our support team, our finance team, someone mentioned uh, the HR team, people who interact with our products, maybe not directly, or our customers, maybe not directly, but still see the impact of what we do, right? And understanding them as stakeholders on the product beyond our users, because they often see things uh, in a different way. The other ones we don't often spend time talking with, and I think we should do, is our customer's customer. So this is primarily for B2B, so you're selling to businesses, uh, a product that then services their customers. How many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you actually talk to your customer's customer? Not enough hands in the room. Come on now. So I'm building a product for a data center operator uh, who services a, uh, an analyst or a data scientist who's relying on the infrastructure that they're putting in front of them to do their job, right? I'm building a product for manufacturer's reps who are selling pieces of electrical equipment to somebody who's a builder or a contractor who's relying on getting it on time and priced appropriately. If you're not following the whole life cycle and journey of the products they're eventually going to sell, we're not fully understanding the impact of the products that we're building. The full life cycle is really important. Interviewing everybody who interacts is really important. So it's all the players. And then it's the cadence. How often are you doing that? I'm a big believer in talking to customers, internal, external, customers, customer, weekly. Having a conversation weekly, not a survey, not a full story evaluation that somebody's sitting behind and seeing, not a video that somebody recorded, actually sitting next to the customer and having a conversation with them, sitting with the finance department, sitting with support, not just looking at ticket reports and, and um, looking at, at frequency of complaints in the ticketing system, but actually having conversation with the people or interacting with our customers on a regular basis. And then having the right tools to listen and learn. So ethnography, familiar with the term? Right? Sitting next to someone and observing them work. This is a really old cartoon, but it still works. So actually watching what they do and letting them describe to you how they're going through it doesn't just happen in discovery. When you're creating new technology to solve a problem that existed that was manual uh, in the past, or maybe it was an old system you're trying to displace with your new technology, sitting down and understanding what they do now that they've been using it for a while and understanding how they operate and just observing, it's deeper than just asking the questions. It's not a, uh, and then what happens when you click here. It's watching what else they do and being authentic in their work. A lot of times I'll see customers or users in front of a system close the window for a minute and go to something else and look something up. What did you just do there? Why did you just do that? Did we, are we not providing something that you need? Is there data that you're pulling from somewhere else that's not integrated? It seems obvious, but a lot of times we miss these little subtle things that they do. Slack message, quick Slack message to somebody else to fill in a blank before I can continue in the product. Very subtle, but often happens. Or they get up and walk away when something's running because we have performance issues and uh, they go and get a cup of coffee. Why are you doing that? Um, because this thing takes forever and so I'm gonna wait for it to finish and then when I come back, we have a performance issue. Does anyone know we have a performance issue, right? This happens all the time, just by basic observation. So I encourage everyone to, to observe and understand what's happening, follow people around. I do that with sales teams a lot. I like to walk around or, or get in a car with sales team even when I was running engineering teams, I would do this just to understand how they sell the product, to see what resonates with our customers, to see when their eyes light up or when they lean back because they clearly don't understand what it is we're trying to sell. Getting all of those insights continuously informs the product and makes the product better, not just at discovery. So I'll give this one last example. Uh, I was a CTO at DigitalOcean the last couple of years but before I went to full time at Harvard. And do you guys know DigitalOcean? Familiar with us? Yeah. So it's also another platform infrastructure company, uh, cloud hosting service, who's renowned for being simple. Beautiful, gorgeous application. Their claim to fame in the beginning, uh, they're only six years old, very young company with millions of users, was uh, spinning up a droplet, which is their equivalent of a virtual machine, in 55 seconds for five bucks. Pretty straightforward, easy, elegant. When I joined the business, they had just the droplet, one product, that was it. Five-year-old company getting ready to release up to seven. Some of them are more really rich features than products, but seven different things, each of them were going to be monetized in some certain way, and the whole company was gonna really change and shift as we had multiple products. When we decided we were gonna start releasing all these things, before I put together the roadmap and got through uh, what was this going to look like, what was the journey for the customer going to be, 
I first looked at the journey of the business and understood how it was going to impact us and how we would be able to service the customer uh, before we went forward. One of our biggest problems was the bill. And one of the things I understood about the bill is not just that it was a problem for us, but the competitive products, there's a couple of them in the northwest corner of the country, uh, that were famous for having really sucky bills. Does anybody work with those companies? You know who I'm talking about, right? Um, their bills are terrible. And the people who are interacting with them are often hiring people, like VPs of engineering were hiring people just to handle the bill. The guy I hired as my VP of engineering was at Atlassian before I hired him. He had two full-time engineers on staff unpacking one of those other companies' bills. Ridiculous, two full-time engineers just to deal with a bill. So one of the things I did in the beginning is said, we're going to have our designers and user experience folks spend more time with our billing department our finance team, our support team to understand what's really going on with the bill before we introduce to light and create more heroic tools for our users. So we overhauled billing. We thought about how we're going to process on the back end. And we didn't just do it as we started to roll those products out. We continuously did it in trying to understand how things were getting better, how things were flowing, and ultimately talking to our customers, their users, their customers to make sure that it was flowing in a way that made sense, beautiful features, beautiful capabilities that made them heroes, but also basic things like the bill, which we sometimes forget, can be just as critical to a business and making that delightful as well. So there's jobs to be done. We want to delight and empower our users. And we want to consider all perspectives. Going back to the hospital bed again, we want to consider the patient sitting in the bed, the nurses and the techs interacting with them, how somebody feels, and considering the whole process uh, throughout as we continue to evolve our products. Most importantly, and it's nice that we had that talk earlier about listening, we want to listen. We want to understand their point of view. They are human beings. They have feelings about how their products, uh, our products work for them, and ultimately uh, reach the end goals that they need to. Thank you.